Pueblo, Colorado. You know, sometimes the most amazing thing that happens to me happens right at the end of my trip. As I'm about to catch a plane, I meet somebody. Today I had the honor of meeting somebody, Mark Salazar. Man, I'm beyond blown away. This is like, he's not like me, he is me. I'm not like him, I am him. His story is so similar. And what he's accomplished in his life, I, I man, I, oh, I couldn't believe. I can't wait to share this with you. You know, with the school, the, the uh, middle school being right across the street, we did have some local gang members trying to recruit the kids right after they got out of school. And I was trying to prevent that. So I really needed not only to provide programming for our kids, to keep them off the street, to keep them away from the gang members. So I needed someone who did know a little bit more about what it's like to be a gang member, what kind of education we can provide for, the, for our young boys and girls on joining gangs or getting out of gangs if they were already in a gang. So I saw Mark in the Chieftain paper and I, it was amazing. I was trying to find him. I didn't have any information about him. I happened to be working at one of the other libraries one Sunday and there he was in the courtyard. And so I approached him immediately, introduced myself and said, this is my problem out at the Lucero Library. Can you help me? When the kids get out of school, Mark is out here. Uh, the gang members, if they're still recruiting, I don't know where they're doing it from. They're not doing it from here anymore. We have ongoing programming. Mark has a program, plus we have youth programs through the library with our youth librarian who's also doing other with 3D printers. We have a maker space going on at the same time that Mark is actually doing his program. So we have two separate programs. This is an amazing story from an amazing person. Let me introduce you to Mark Salazar. So, you know, I was able to touch base with her and she just embraced me and what I'm doing, you know, with open arms and was, you know, and allowed me to work out of the Lucero Library. So that gave me access to kids that I normally did not have access to working out of here because, if, as you can see, right across the street from here, we have a middle school. Right on the other block, we have an elementary. So we got a combination of different kids coming in. And so, you know, like she has said, I, I normally provide just, it's a therapeutic you know, mentoring program is, is basically is what I'm providing here because the curriculum, as we had stated earlier about the evidence-based curriculum, of course, you know, these youngsters are just doing the program voluntarily. So it's not something that uh, a curriculum that they would actually have to sit there and be required to do like through the states or something. Of course, I have evidence-based curriculum in which I'm working with, you know, uh, other agencies as far as implementing that. You know, but that's, you know, you know, a process. But here, at least here, you know, from 3.30 to 5.30 and 1.30 to 5, 1.30 to 3.30 on Fridays, you know, at least gives me an access to these, to these youngsters so that I can start, you know, not only just providing the therapeutic mentoring, but also trying to school them on the game of chess. I, I, I tell them time and again, you know, the game of life is like the game of chess and it requires that you make the right moves. You know, how many of us are actually making the right moves? It is really imperative that we step out here and, and so that we can actually, you know, hear from the youngsters, what is it that you need? You know, how can we help you help yourselves? You know, a lot of this, you know, this heroin epidemic, it's just po it's poverty driven, you know? And so when you're living in an environment, you know what I mean, where, where you know, there's a lot of poverty, I mean, you're gonna have a lack of means to be able to do programs, you know, uh, football, wrestling, you know, so on and so forth, that all costs is money. Money that, you know, a lot of these, you know, single mothers ain't got a lot of, you know, and even just, you know, families. I mean, fathers are being taken away from the home. There's an absence of fathers for a variety of reasons, you know. And, uh, and, and so these youngsters, I think they need positive male role models, you know. Of course, I'm a man of many flaws, but I feel that life is a process of self-correction. Many of them know who I am or heard of me, and, you know, I, I had done what I could do to establish a reputation growing up for, uh, for acting a fool and just being a little knucklehead. I had actually had shot a, a good friend of mine who, you know, I, I, you know, had disrespected me. A sneaker punched me from my mom, you know. Fortunately, you know, uh, things played out, at, you know, on that night 
where I uh, ended up shooting him twice in the chest and I got in a shootout with the police, you know, and I got shot five times. And uh, I, was, I, I survived that, you know, went to prison and everything. And I try to share these youngsters, you know, I, I know, you know, you talk, you want to talk about the dope game or you want to talk about straight gang banging, you know, if they, they can't blow smoke up, you know, me and tell me that, you know, hey, no, those are just friends, you know, because we got a lot, like right now we got these youngsters that uh, only the family and then OTF are uh, crumbs to bricks. You know, those two young, those two groups of youngsters, and of course they're um, groups of uh, juveniles, you know, and they consider themselves not to be, you know, a gang, but family, and same, you know, same thing, you know, and it's a process of them just being told what to think versus how to think, and that's what I'm trying to teach them here with the, the school, like, you know, time and again, we're always told what to think versus how to think, and so I'm trying to teach them, like, the game of life is played like the game of chess, and it requires that you make you know, strategic, you know, moves. You know, f people asked him, how'd you get off of drugs? How'd you get sober? And he goes, I went to prison. I was like, that's what I say. I went to prison. I found my sobriety in prison because I went to prison. Some people say hey, we need to institute help, not handcuffs. Sometimes those handcuffs save our lives. And they saved him, let me explain how. Yeah. I mean, I, I first experienced with uh, weed and uh, marijuana and uh, alcohol at 12 years old, you know. And of course, you know, my, my mom and dad, you know, at times they went through stages where they were functional alcoholics, you know. And so when they would pass out, my brother and I had easy access to the amphetamines or the weed or the coke, you know. And, um, but, you know, and so we always had easy access to it, you know. And so, of course, as I got older, there was there was never a day I was sober. And people asked me, well, how did you get sober? I was like, I went to prison. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, how did you quit? <laughs> I was like, I went to prison. Because yeah, that's where it led me. Before I went to prison, <clears throat> at 15 years old, if you would have asked me, where do you see yourself, you know, five, 10 years from now? Most kids see themselves in high school, you know, graduating, so on and so forth. Me, I already had sold myself short on the concept that I wasn't entitled to a much better lifestyle than that in which I was living. So my dad may have not taught my brother and I, you know, about, you know, fishing and camping and how to go hunting and all that, things of that nature, but he did teach us about the dope game, you know what I mean? And so we were well familiar with that, my brother and I, and so, you know, that, you know, because the only thing that we've ever, you know, that I've ever fished, you know what I mean, was fishing cell to cell, you know what I mean? The only thing I ever hunted was hunting each other down, you know what I mean? And, you know, uh, gang banging back in the day. Far too often it's glamorized. It's glamorized through music, it's glamorized through entertainment, it's glamorized, you know what I mean, as society. The reality of it is, is that, you know, they don't glamorize the non-contact visit from behind a glass wall, you know what I mean, from behind glass, you know. They don't, they don't glamorize the psychological and the emotional pain that one deals with, with losing the loss of a loved one while being incarcerated. You know, they don't, they don't glamorize that, why? Because it doesn't sell. I'm out here to try to let them know then if, if someone like myself can, you know, endure, you know, live the lifestyle that I led and then also, you know, in, in, you know, overcome a lot of the obstacles, you know what I mean, such as the being, you know, jumped numerous times, being shot five times, being stabbed, you know, surviving eight and a half years in prison, you know, to overcome that and, and go actually come back out here with the sense uh, in a vision, you know, because like I told you prior to prison, I seen myself in prison. I had a vision of me going to prison. I knew I was going to be in prison. I just didn't know for what for ha and, and for how long, you know, but before I got out of prison, I developed a new vision. I developed a new vision and that vision is to be doing exactly what I'm doing, you know, because I told individuals before I got out, I said, when I get out of prison, I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to, you know what I mean? I'm going to, I'm going to start up my own, you know, gang prevention program and start trying to school these youngsters and so on and so forth. And a lot of people, you know what I mean? I had some naysayers and I had some supporters, you know, that gave me their blessings, you know, and I got out and I just led by example and, and I did it. And I share that with these youngsters in hopes of not to impress them, but to impress upon them. Because like you said, you know, if, if you can do it, you know what I mean? There ain't no reason why any of these youngsters can sit here and tell you what, that they can't do it because, you know, we're sitting here with, you know, two, three felonies, if not more, under our belt, you know, and yet we're able to, you know, use those as stepping stones as opposed to obstacles. But when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, running around, acting a fool, 
Um, I didn't have someone my age intervene and say, hey, check it out, little homie. You know what I mean? It ain't got to be like that. You know what I mean? There's another option. There's alternatives. You know what I mean? There's this. There's that. You know, chance, if had that happened, the chances of me probably, you know, strain and, and you know, and, and experiencing half of the stuff I did probably would have never happened. You know, who's to say? But at least the, uh, the opportunity for me to do much better from there would have been, you know, greater. I mean, I don't consider myself to be an addict or an alcoholic and the sim simply because I don't believe that no man or woman is defined by one aspect of their character. You know, one win doesn't make an individual a forever winner. You know, one loss doesn't make an individual a forever loser. And so I just don't think that, you know, we should be judged. You know, like they say, don't judge a book by its look. But, you know, that's unfortunately we live in a society that, you know, is real swift to do that. You know, and so when they see me looking like this, they're all, instantly they think gangbanger. But they, little would they know that, hey, man, I got my associates. I'm, I'm one year shy of my bachelor's. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm certified to day team counselor through the state of Colorado. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, they don't know, get to know that about me until they get to talk to me. I mean, because I think that when you define an individual by the term addict, you know, you, you focus on just that one element and, and you forget all the good about them. It's like there, there's so much good even to... You know what I mean? I think there's just a little bit of, you know, a little bit of good and even in the worst of people. And I think there's a little bit of bad even in the best of us. I mean, it's just, I think that when you focus on that, you just, I mean, because a lot of us, I mean, we have, you know, like yourself, you know, I have a passion, you know, for working with these at-risk youth. And so I'm all about chasing my passion, not my pension, you know. And so that's why, you know, I took the pay cut from, you know, working from at crossroads, you know, turning points where I was working at. To our, you know, to what I'm making today, you know, because to me, it's not all about money. You know, uh, when I came to Pueblo, Colorado, um, I loved it. Uh, the, 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 the buildings, the architecture, the scenery, the river, the people. And right before leaving, I was able to meet somebody that I'll never forget and someone that I'm going to work with for the rest of my life to reach these kids because he's been there and done that. I'm so honored and proud that I was able to meet this man and share his story with you. We'll see you on the next episode of On the Road to Recovery. I'm Michael DeLeon.